Ooh. Now that's scary. Hi, I'm Stephen King, but you already knew that. Technology. It has brought us closer together than ever before. But imagine, if you will, that technology could in fact be our undoing. That is the chilling revelation I dare you to consider in my hit horror novel, Cell. Could cell phones be turning us into mindless, brain-dead zombies? Think on it, won't you? And with that, I present Cell Ending Explained. Hey guys, welcome to Ending Explained. Today I'll be looking at Cell, a zombie techno thriller drama. Actually, I don't really know what to call this thing. It's weird. And this is the first time that I will say, if you haven't seen this movie, don't bother. Just watch this video and save 90 minutes of your life. Yeah, it's not great. And the ending, it's complete gobbledygook. So let's see if I can figure this one out. It's based on a book and screenplay by Stephen King and stars John Cusack and Sam Jackson in the Dream Team reunion of 1408 we've all been waiting for. I'm not a King hater, but his later output has kind of been all over the place. He's seemingly coasting on the brand of Stephen King rather than adding any seminal works to his catalog. But that won't stop people from making everything he writes into movies, which brings us to Cell. Basically, there's a strange signal that goes off simultaneously from people's cell phones and turns them into violent zombies. Well, sort of zombies. They're still people, but they call them phoners. No phoners come through here? Phoners. This whole signal mind control thing is eerily similar to Jackson's plan in Kingsman as well. Anyway, Cusack is a graphic designer going through difficulties with his estranged family. He's at the airport on the phone with his son Johnny, and geez, look at all the people on their cell phones. When will they learn? Cell phones equal evil, y'all. Then a signal pulses out from everyone's cell phones and all hell breaks loose. Cusack is forced to fend for his life, including with this weird spider ball thing that he has. He meets up with a subway driver played by Sammy Jackson. They team up and make their way to finding Cusack's son. But but another recruit joins them on the way out. Probably my favorite character in the movie, DJ Liquid! They call me DJ Liquid. But alas, it was not meant to be. A few seconds later in the tunnels, he meets his end from a phoner with an ax. DJ Liquid, no! We didn't even get his full backstory. How did he become the one and only DJ Liquid? I'm sure there's like 150 pages in the book dedicated just to this character. Chapter 17, The Ballad of DJ Liquid. DJ Lick Most of the movie is just the two of them walking around, having encounters with other survivors, and learning more about the phoners along the way. Their first stop is Cusack's apartment, where we meet Alice, his upstairs neighbor, and also see drawings from Cusack's graphic novel, featuring a mysterious red-hooded man. In the streets, they see the phoners moving in flocks, like birds. Later, they all open their mouths, transmitting a signal, and it appears that the phoners have a hive mind, uploading in unison to some main source out in the world. We learn even more about the phoners when they arrive at Gaiety Academy, run by by headmaster and research superstar Stacy Keach. Seriously, this guy seems to know so much about their behavior after like one day of observing them. He believes that this is actually the next stage of human evolution we are seeing. And it seems like the rest of the class is all in a massive pile in the football field, all at rest, transmitting music. Oh man, that's a lot of phoners. What happens when they wake up? Instead of finding out, our heroes set into action, deciding to torch the whole field and kill hundreds of kids. Are we sure we wanna do this? Oh yeah, for sure. Seems like a similar conversation probably happened when they decided to do the movie. So our heroes drive a truck over the field, dousing the sleeping phoners in gasoline. At one point, they get stuck on a body, unable to roll over the head. What the fuck is this? Or does King just love seeing kids get their heads run over? Keach sends out a flaming arrow, igniting the field. Some of the phoners start coming too, bodies on fire, running around. So they get shot. This whole part just seems messed up. These guys are supposed to be our heroes. How can we help cure these people? Fuck it, light them up. Later, Cusack has a dream featuring a red hooded guy in a bathroom, and I'm pretty sure that's his wife he has. Weirdly, the kid and Alice also had a dream featuring the same red hooded guy who is called Raggedy Man. Turns out he's a character from Cusack's comic and the same we saw sketches of earlier in his apartment. He refers to him as the Night Traveler, a prophet of the apocalypse. I see. Has Cusack's character somehow come to life and is now the bringer of the cell apocalypse? I hope not, because that would be really dumb. The survivors come across a bar and see a sign tagged with Kaushok, no phones. Inside, we are introduced to our next batch of one scene supporting characters. We've got the Irish bartender, the sexed up cougar, and the guy with a voice box. They find out that Kaushok is an unincorporated zone in Maine, a place where there's no cell phone towers and where people who haven't been pulsed are heading for salvation. Here, Cusack laments to Alice about his life and leaving his family. He had a shit job at a stupid graphic design firm, so he quit his job to work on comics and left to 
his wife and kid a year ago. Wait, graphic designer? That's still a really good job, dude, but it wasn't enough for him. He wants to be special. All right, bro, if you say so, but you sound like kind of a wiener. While everyone is sleeping, Sally the Cougar Lady goes to investigate a sound and gets pulsed through the door. Later, Cusack wakes up and Sally is just standing there. She must have let some phoners in and they all come to and attack the bar. Sally hits Alice with a pull cue and she starts to bleed out on the floor. It's a really stupid death for the character, but another thing that bugged me about this scene. If the evil is trying to convert people, then why didn't they do it when everyone was asleep? Instead, they all wait around for everyone to wake up so they can have a dramatic reveal. Yee! And now that all those characters had their one scene, you know what that means, back on the road. This time we meet Ray and Denise who have accents and kill phone freaks. That's their thing. Ray apparently knew they would come saying that the president of the internet told him. He hasn't been sleeping for days and clearly it's having an adverse effect on his thinking. He's super paranoid and well, pretty nuts. They get inside of people's minds. They get inside your mind, Ray? No. Not on, my, not on my mind. He says that Koshak is a front, actually designed to lure people there in their dreams. Damn those crafty phoners. At a river, Ray is clearly losing it and gives Cusack a cell phone, telling him to use it when he reaches the end of the road, then blows himself up. Yep. Then they finally make it to Cusack's old house and it appears empty. Thanks to a very verbose note left by Johnny with magnet letters, we find out that he is headed to Koshak. Cusack continues searching the house and then Raggedy Man leaps out from a closet, acting all weird. Cusack beats the hell out of him, kicking his head in and shooting him a bunch. Well, that's the end of that, right? But it wasn't Raggedy. It was actually his wife turned phoner. Well, that's too bad, even though he never mentions trying to find his wife once. Only his precious boy, Johnny. She's no big deal, apparently. So Cusack leaves the group, heading to Koshak on his own in Ray's bomb-filled truck. They try to make it seem very intense and moody with this overbearing music. It's really funny because at one point, they just cut to some B-roll of ducks. Damn, those are some intense foul. Look at them, swimming peacefully. Ah! He reaches the literal end of the road, revealing a huge fucking cell tower with thousands of phoners orbiting around it. This must be the main tower, and they're kind of like moths drawn to the light or signal source in this case. In the middle of the circle, Raggedy is waiting. Cusack runs down the road, hitting Red Boy with the truck. That's gotta hurt. He says some digital garbage and Cusack fills him full of lead, well pellets. Suddenly a voice is heard all around him, his boy, saying hi dad over and over, accompanied by a high pitched warbling, ramping in intensity. Cusack butts his way through the crowd of phoners looking for Johnny and gets trampled. Very slowly. Could just move out of the way. Seems quite easy. And as Cusack lies there amongst the sea of phoners, he knows that this is the end of the road. He pulls out Ray's cell phone about to dial, but someone's there. It's Johnny. Yay! He gives him a big hug. Cusack's gloves provided by Under Armour. Then everyone screams in unison and Raggedy is seen alive. Johnny screeches too. He's also a phoner. Oh no, all that for nothing. Cusack makes the call, causing the explosive filled ice cream truck to explode, taking down the tower and a bunch of the phoners. After the explosion, we were presented with a very dreamlike scene, warm and fuzzy. Cusack and his boy walk together, seeing a tag left by the other survivors on a tree, making their way towards Canada. But then we cut back to the main tower, still standing. Phoners continuing to circle. The truck is seen unexploded and Raggedy's body is gone. What? We go into the crowd and see that Cusack is amongst the phoners doing his best zombie shuffle. The end. Wow, that was the final shot of the movie? This weird close up of Cusack looking all goofy and shit? Jeez. Okay, so I'm gonna do my best to figure out what the hell is really going on at the end. First off, it's easy to think of the possibility that the whole movie was in Cusack's head and he's always been amongst the flock, but I don't think so. Since we see the truck has made it, he must have at least met Ray and everything up to that point has to be real. I think that once he broke the crowd and encountered Raggedy, this is when he was pulsed. The explosion and heroic self-sacrifice that was all a dream. Cusack, as I said, wanted to be special and saving the world would certainly fit the bill. So in his phone addled mind, this is the reality that was created. In the end, he's no different than everyone else, doomed to be another unknown amongst the flock, not an individual. And as far as the hooded guy, raggedy man, he must be a construct of Cusack's mind, not real. This is backed up by Cusack killing him twice and both times it wasn't actually him. The first time it was his wife and the second time the body disappears since you know, he probably wasn't ever there in the first place. As far as the others seeing him in their dreams, it still makes some sense as the pulse is able to manipulate people via the hive mind. And this fits in with that. To Cusack, raggedy was the embodiment of everything behind the apocalypse. And again, based on his own comic creation. So 
he must have manifested this persona he knows as a demon of big data to have a specific villain on his heroic quest to be special or save the world. When it comes to who is behind the attack, why it happened, or anything like that, we are given no information whatsoever. It just happens, kind of like most things in the movie. They happen just because. And I don't mind when a movie doesn't give all the answers to the story, but this was just lazy in the end. It's like they got to page 90 and were like, how do we end this thing? Throw in some bullshit twist ending that's nearly incomprehensible. People love those. So I looked at the ending for the book and it is different, but it doesn't make any more sense. Essentially, Cusack does get his boy back and finds out about a different signal that could potentially turn him back to normal. At the end, Cusack dials a number waiting for the pulse, the end. So, still pretty obnoxious, but at least they touched on something they really didn't cover at all in the movie. Is it possible to turn these people back to normal? It seems like it's possible they could have made an alternate signal of some sort that would reverse the effects of the original. But instead, everyone just plods around the whole movie, not really doing much. And it seems to reinforce that King is very capable of setting up a story, but loses steam and perhaps interest by the time he's done. Man, how many more pages do I need? Alright, here's some more stuff. Okay, that's it for Cell, but it won't be long until the next ending explained. Next week, I'll be looking at Midnight Special. So if you're not subscribed, make sure you do so now so you don't miss it. Also make sure to enter the giveaway for sweet Funko Pops and other great prizes. All you have to do is like our Facebook page to enter. What did you guys think of Cell's ending? Do you agree with my theory or have some ideas of your own? Let me know down in the comments. See you next time and thanks for watching.